Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Lennox. I'm on the Northampton Neighbors Board and on the Speaker Series Committee that brings you this and other events. And I'm going to first tell you a little bit about Northampton Neighbors and then how the session today will run. And then I'm going to introduce Howard Bryant. So first about Northampton Neighbors. Uh, Northampton Neighbors launched in 2017. Uh, we now have 949 members. I checked on the website today, which I think is really terrific. Uh, we're part of an international movement called the Village Movement. And what village, villages do is help people, older people in particular places, um, find the services and the social and cultural connections they need to stay in their own homes as they age. Uh, Northampton Neighbors is open to anybody, anywhere, but we provide services, or at least we used to provide services before COVID. Maybe I hope we will again soon. Um, we provide services performed by our volunteers to anyone over 55 living in Northampton, Florence, and Leeds. Uh, one of the really great things about Northampton Neighbors is that we're free, which means that anyone can join. It isn't just open to people with means, and that makes us different from almost all the other villages in the country. Um, though we're not providing in-person services right now, we found lots of other ways to get people together and make their lives a little less lonely, um, like interest groups, there's a gardening group, there's a book group, um, there's a food interest group. We also have neighborhood circles um, in various parts of the city that meet via Zoom. And of course, this speaker series. Um, those of you who've been around for a while um, might remember that we hosted a lot of great speakers in the Senior Center. Um, and they've been just as great since beginning last May when we decided to resort to Zoom to continue our series. And now they happen every two weeks on Friday at three, as you know. If you'd like to listen to any you missed, um, they're all on the Northampton Neighbors website, uh, northamptonneighbors.org. So now what's going to happen today? Um, Howard would like very much to have a back and forth with the audience. He, he says that in his experience, people always have a lot to say about sports. So he's gonna talk about 15 minutes and then he'd like to respond to your questions and um, you know, have a give and take. Um, so please put your questions in the chat, which you do by um, going to the bottom of your page, wiggling your mouse around, you'll see a little icon, a little um, speech bubble that says chat. Click on that, and then you can type your questions in the space that comes up on the right-hand side of the screen. And then you press enter, and Howard and everybody can see your questions. Um, we thought it would it it wouldn't be a good idea to have people unmute and ask questions because it could get very cacophonous. But if you have a follow-up question for Howard or you want to discuss his answer with him, um, please unmute then and you can um, you can talk. Um, so um, we also want to tell you that if you have hearing problems or if you just want to read the um, what's being said as we go along. There's two different ways of doing it. Um, you'll see in the, on, in the left hand top of your screen, um, there's something that says, click here to open live transcript. And we have another way on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you wiggle your mouse around, there's something that says CC live transcript. And that also will give you a transcript. Um, You've seen that the, this event is being recorded. Um, you won't show up in the recording. The gallery won't show up in the recording. If you'd rather not have people see right now, just turn your camera off. And um, as we've said, if you'd like to hear the talk again, or if you'd like to recommend it to your friends, um, just go to the Northampton Neighbors website and find the recording. Okay, and now to the main event, Howard Bryant. 
Um, Howard has been a senior writer for ESPN since 2007 um, and the sports correspondent for NPR's Weekend Edition, Saturday with Scott Simon since 2006. Before that, he was columnist for the Oakland Tribune, the San Jose Mercury News, the Bergen Herald, the Boston Herald, and the Washington Post. He's been a two-time finalist for the National Magazine Award for Commentary. He's the author of nine books including his latest full dissidence notes from an uneven playing food field. You might have noticed that that book was featured in the window of Broadside Bookstore as one of their top books of 2020. And I know, and some other people on this, uh, <laughs> like Rachel Naismith um, on this Zoom, um, know that it's a really fabulous group because we read it in our Northampton Neighbors book group and Howard generously came to our Zoom meeting and discussed it with, that, with us, which is when I discovered what, how fabulous he is. So Howard's work has appeared in 17 other books and anthologies, and he has served as a consultant on several films, including Baseball, The Tenth e Inning, Jackie Robinson, Hemingway, and Muhammad Ali, all by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. So today he's going to be talking to us about a topic that could not be more relevant at this moment, the house divided sports in a polarized America. So take it away, Howard. Well, thank you everyone for having me. This is, um, <clears throat> it's always fun to do things that are local, not just because we've been locked in the house for a year, but just also to connect with the community and, and it's, uh, I just got done a few minutes ago. Everything is bumping up into each other today for some reason. I was doing the, um, the San Antonio Book Festival. So this is a little bit closer to home than that, even though I haven't left my chair. So, um, and then I'm just getting a message right now from my employers telling me that I have to go um, in like an hour. So I'm um, sorry, I have to cut this a little bit short, but it's along the exact same lines of what we're talking about. I have to go on Sports Center to go do the, um, they wanna talk about the masters and what is happening in Georgia right now and what is going on with that. And so it is very much appropriate to the conversation, uh, Jermaine, to what we're gonna talk about. Um, is whether or not the Augusta National has a responsibility to react to this uh, voting law in Georgia. We saw Major League Baseball move out, uh, move the All-Star game out of Cobb County where the Braves play. And it just sort of feeds into this continuation of a real sort of tectonic shift in sports. And maybe it's more of a shift in attitude than the actual reality and that sports are the place that brings us together. And when you think about all of the different places, especially in a, in a technological world where you have 300 channels and so much siloing and so much bifurcation that people still watch the Super Bowl. They still watch the Bruins. They still watch the Celtics, et cetera. And so, uh, but even that is changing now because we have so much uh, taking place in terms of the merging of sports and politics and all of those different intersections, which is turning sports into a place where it hadn't been before, which is a place of division instead of a place of unity. Um, I see that a lot of the cameras are off. So I guess I was going to say that with a group this small, it's really not very big, it's 22 people, that there was no reason to put your questions in a chat. Um, you could just raise your hand, I can see you, and I'll, we can just do it that way. But if the cameras are off, then I can't see you. I won't be able to see if you have your hand up. Um, so if you have questions, I'll just answer them in the chat as they, as they go along. Um, so yes, yeah, so I felt like one of the things that was important to consider in this division is not just, you can go back to me, I think I go back maybe um, the real, the, the, for me, the, the, the return of this, let's say, it does go back to 9-11 for me. I think that was one of the big moments where I think that when you watch sports or when you covered sports, the, the attitude of the teams, the attitudes of the leagues were that politics was bad for business, that at some point you're going to anger half of your audience, no matter what position that you took. The players we know have always been political. They've always had positions, whether we were talking about whether you go back to Jackie Robinson or Muhammad Ali or the, you know, the Olympic teams or whatever, all of those different examples, the players have their own opinions and they're, they're, they have a right to them. 
but the industry of sports wanted to avoid that. The, the Red Sox or the Celtics or whoever, they didn't take political positions because they didn't want to anger, and they didn't want to anger paying customers. And so 9-11 really changed that. And 9-11, and I remember I was covering the Yankees at that time. And so that was a moment where, and we really haven't gotten past it, where sports and the politics of uh, patriotism, the politics of war, the politics of, of this sort of jingoism of the military and policing and all of these different things really began with 9-11. And if you go back, if you go back historically, we, when we were in times of national crisis, you could see sports get involved. You saw, you know, the players, baseball players wore patches in World War II during that time period. You saw that when there were issues, you know, with the Cold War, obviously the, you know, Americans boycotted the Olympics in 1980 and the Russians boycotted the Olympics in 84. Um, you saw in other times of war, you know, Vietnam as well, you know, the players would go over and, um, you know, do some USO types of events. But for the most part, these were one-offs. These were individual moments. And when those crises were over, sports went back to neutral. We obviously, people remember the uh, iconic Whitney Houston national anthem during the Gulf War and, and, and the patches and all of those things that took place during that period. But once that war ended, the patches came off, the American flags came off, all that went away. With 9-11, that's not what happened. With 9-11, all of a sudden you saw flags the size of the football field, I know, and across the diamond, I'm sorry, across the outfield, if you're watching a Red Sox game or whatever, and then you see the flags and the flyovers and the policing and the national anthem and the military on the field. And this is something that has been taking place for 20 years now. We've got a 9-11 anniversary coming up in September. It's been 20 years. And that has really fundamentally changed what sports, the, the look and the feel of sports. And so in addition to that shift, there was also another shift that took place too, which was the commodification of it. And so most sports fans, when you're watching a game and you see the military doing, you know, singing the national anthem, or you see them out there doing these uh, inductions on field and all of those things, it gave the public the impression that you were watching in organic support of the war effort. And that's not what was happening. What was happening is, is that the military in the 2000s really began to see enlistments drop and they realized that sports was a wonderful recruiting tool. It's a great place to recruit. And so the, so the National Guards across the country and the Pentagon, they would call and they would make business deals with sports teams. The Milwaukee Brewers paid the Wisconsin National Guard $80,000 to sing the national anthem. And you had the Red Sox and the Celtics and the Patriots and all of these sports teams, they were all embedding themselves into the military. So now when you, and our network as well, and ESPN, the different broadcast networks, not wanting to look unpatriotic, they would have all these different crowd shots of soldiers in uniform. But those soldiers weren't just there because they wanted to see the game. They were plants. The military was paying them to be there so they could get crowd shots as well to sort of boost up the war effort. I was talking to a three-star general, Russell Honore, who was wonderful in the, um, the Katrina cleanup and the, the uh, recovery there. And he was telling me that, um, that you may not like it, but this is good business for us as military, that we need numbers and sports because of the the dynamic of sports the wins and the losses the good guy and the bad guy the automatically having uh an opponent that it gravitate that you could gravitate toward a certain type of person who might make a good soldier so this is a recruiting effort and i'd said to him well general with all due respect i'm not sure i want my 10 year old being recruited while he's watching a football game of course, my son doesn't watch football anyway, but I said it anyway. And, um, and he said, too bad. He said, too bad. He says, you know, and I tell that to parents everywhere. This is an unprecedented opportunity for us to reach people. 30 million people, 100 million people watching an event, 80,000 people in one place at one time. We need, you know, we need your kids. And so 
I took real offense to that. Um, and I thought that was something I appreciated his honesty because the leagues weren't telling you this. And it wasn't until 2014, 2015, when the late John McCain and the other Arizona Senator, uh, Jeff Flake, they finally did an investigation of this. And they did a, they did a senatorial report called Tackling Paid Patriotism. And they, they detailed specifically what these sports leagues were doing and how they were taking taxpayer money and how they were using sports as a way to, um, to profit and, and how the sports teams were using the military as a way to profit. And, and it was, and these were Republicans, you know, Jeff Flake and John McCain. So it wasn't as though this was some sort of great democratic liberal conspiracy. It was simply something that they felt was offensive to them. And so obviously the leagues were embarrassed and they promised to pay back the money, but they still keep doing what they're doing. They just do it in, you know, in, in different ways. But that template has now been set. And then on top of having that template be set, now we see the players on the other side doing the same thing because not really the same thing, but because they're, they don't own the franchises. But now the players are inserting their politics into the, into the sports as well through protest after Trayvon Martin was killed, after Ferguson with Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. And we also see with the Atlanta Dream, as we saw last year, the WNBA team actively campaigning against Kelly Leffler, who was the co-owner of that team. So suddenly you have this arena of sports now being a place where the, the idea or the veneer of neutrality is no longer existent. That what you're seeing now is a, is a, is a real battle. Um, and it changes the way people watch sports. In fact, people like to ascribe this shift to Colin Kaepernick and they like to, they like to uh, ascribe it to the players and the players politics or LeBron James or whomever, but it really does to me go back to 9-11 because on the one hand, you had this, this idea of patriotism being embedded into the game. And now on the other hand, you have protests being embedded into the game all within this 20 year period. And it really has shifted how we view the games. And I think obviously now when you begin to add a pandemic into it, it just gets heightened because as you're watching, you watch the Red Sox, there's 8% or 9% capacity. And then you watch a game in a red state, you watch the Texas Rangers were playing the Blue Jays the other day, there were 40,000 people in the stands and there's still a pandemic going on. And yet this is another example of, of the politicizing of what's taking place in this country through sports. And so you see it across the board. You see it with the all-star game in Georgia. You see it uh, throughout the time with the pandemic. You're seeing it um, in, in so many different ways. We saw it with Colin Kaepernick. We see it with uh, the teams deciding who they're gonna sign or not, or who they're going to penalize for kneeling. You saw it last year during the pandemic when during the, um, the Western and Southern Open, Naomi Osaka decided not to play after Jacob Blake was shot in Kenosha. And so there's this new question that we're asking anytime something is happening on a national level, well, what are the players gonna do? Are the players gonna boycott? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to the game? Um, you see this counter, this counter response as we've seen in Atlanta right now with so many people filling up my inbox saying they're never gonna watch another baseball game again because the All-Star game is not being played in Georgia this year. So it really does create a, cer a certain dynamic that I think is new. And I think it's different for sports because I think sports has always had a lane that it could rely on. And I think the pandemic has a lot to do with this where sports has always felt that its lane was to bring people together. Well, what do you do in the middle of a pandemic when bringing people together is precisely the problem. You can't bring people together. So this is a, a new lane for sports. It's a new place for it. And it will be very interesting to see how the industry of sports navigates this because it is unnatural for them and, and, and for it rather. And so one of the things that I've really been working on uh, throughout has been even in a thing like the Olympics, which is coming up if they decide to hold them is when you're looking at so much polarization and one of the areas of that polarization that's really important to consider has been something that used to be a, a ritual of excitement, which was when your team wins the championship, you go to the White House. 
And now the athletes themselves are deciding whether to go based on who's there. When the Bruins won the Stanley Cup, Tim Thomas, the goalie, didn't want to go because Barack Obama was in office. And then obviously after Donald Trump, nobody wanted to go, except the players that did go were, were criticized. And so it was this, it became this, this critical question on the players or placed upon the players. If you win, are you going to the White House? Which was essentially a way of saying, what are your politics? What do you stand for? What are your values? And so it's the, 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 the game itself is in a very difficult place. And you'll see it during the Olympics as well in that the, it's very difficult now. It's, more, it's easier for me to root for foreign players because where we are today, you're wondering where people stand. Can I root for you if I know that your politics don't align with my values? And, and how are we going to navigate that as citizens? Uh, I think that some of these questions have been, they've been asked along different lines anyway. I think for me, that's a question that I've asked over concussions in football, which is not a partisan issue, but it is a value issue. When you're watching these games and you're realizing just what the brutality and the violence of this sport does to people, where is our responsibility in watching it? And there's sort of a voyeuristic element to this when you know that these players are killing themselves for our entertainment. And so it's, it's more complicated now. The business is more complicated now than it's, than it's ever been. And so these are the, so this is the sort of the framework in which um, I'm doing my work. And, and it makes for, it makes for a really interesting trip to the clubhouse whenever we get to go back into clubhouses and to talk to players because the players themselves are very busy trying to concentrate being good at their jobs and now they're being asked other questions and so most athletes they're trying to concentrate they they want to avoid news cycles they want to put the the blinders on and have that tunnel vision to concentrate on what they do and they can't do that and so on the one hand, you'll see some players who are who are really, really adept at navigating these issues. And then you see others just sort of go and they they back away. I remember, Tom, you know, Tom Brady was, you know, had a MAGA hat in his locker and then people wanted to know what that was all about. He didn't really want to deal with it. But yet there it was in public. And so which made people wonder if he was, um, you know, was he trolling people? How can you put that there and not ask questions, not answer questions? If you want your politics to be private, why are you advertising them? And so it, it's sort of nonstop. And, and I think that um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how the players navigate this new place that they're in as they got involved last year in some of the different political issues. And, and I don't even like really calling them political issues because somebody being shot when they're unarmed or having a knee on their back doesn't sound like a political issue at all. That's not politics. That's a question of decency and humanity. Um, but it does get roped under the rubric of politics. So I'm very interested in seeing how the players navigate this and how long like we're seeing right now, whether it's the Masters, whether it's going to be the, uh, the All-Star Game, all of these different questions, what is there? Uh, their, their level of stamina and what will they do when they realize the limits of what they're capable of and how much citizenry do they really feel like engaging in when they're so beyond a lot of our concerns. I saw Robert had a copy of my first book, Shut Out Up, um, a little earlier, and I was asked a question yesterday. I was doing an event yesterday and Someone was asking me about where that, where that civics lesson went, where that citizen, citizenry left when it came to players. And I said, well, they're not citizens anymore. I mean, they're, you know, you make a, you know, you had a $380 million contract. Your, your kid's not going to public school. I mean, when I wrote Shut Out, one of the reasons why the players with the Red Sox were so engaged in what was happening with busing and everything else was because some of their kids were in the school system. Uh, today, with that level of wealth and that level of distance from everyday concerns, they're not part of us anymore. The distance is so great. And in 1975, the average baseball player made seven times what the average American made. Today, that number is almost 50 times. I mean, the average, the, av the minimum 
major league salary is almost six hundred thousand dollars. So just to walk on the field, you're making six hundred thousand dollars, whether you sit the bench or not. The average salary is a little under five million. So the concerns are different. Um, so yeah, so that is sort of what um, that's where I'm at. That's sort of the thought process that I'm having in dealing with sports. We're in a situation right now where we don't really have the same level of access because of the pandemic. So we don't just walk into the clubhouse and talk to players anymore. Um, so that's a little different. Um, but it, I, I am looking forward to hopping back in and seeing sort of what this uh, new world will look like. Uh, it is interesting as well when you look at when you you have so many different areas where there's opportunities for polarization. Uh, I was talking to a player last night who I will not embarrass, who tried to tell me that the uh, and I asked him if he got his shot and he's like, well, no, I'm not going to get my shot because this shot is a you know it's a it's it's a it's a plot to reduce population. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so that was interesting. So when you walk into the room, there the the Yankees have a one really interesting sort of group think about vaccinations that they're very much behind it. And the Mets, on the other hand, they're really as a group as players, they're not really all that enthusiastic about vaccinations. LeBron James was out last year telling everyone to go vote and getting involved, but yet. Now he's like, well, I don't really want to talk about my positions about vaccinations. And so once again, all of these different positions are in a spot that we thought were that we thought was uncomplicated. And what does that do to our entertainment? What does that do to looking at them as people? What does it do to our ability to enjoy them as athletes? And so uh, it's a, it's a really interesting time in sports. Um, if anybody has any questions about any of this, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Um, so um, first, um, a word from your sponsor. Uh, Nina, could you highlight me? Yes. Um, first of all, let's thank Howard. That's really great. That's so interesting. So we found that you can't really unmute and clap on Zoom. It's There's too much time lag, but we are all clapping virtually. Well, so. I can see you. Okay, it was like we're clapping. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, and now a word from your sponsor. Um, as I said before, um, Northampton Neighbors is free, but that doesn't mean we don't have expenses. So we have to rely on your donations. Um, so we'd really appreciate your helping us out if you're able to um, by going to the website and clicking on the donate button. And you can donate there by credit card, by PayPal, or by check. And I also want to tell you that our next speaker is on April 23rd, um, Jennifer Taub, talking about big, dirty money, making white collar criminals pay. Um, and her book of that title was reviewed by the New York Times. So I think this one, too, is one you aren't going to want to miss. So, OK, um, let's go um, to the question. Have, I was going to say, we have questions here. I'm going to go through the ones that Good. I can Yes, great, great. Let's so let's that. go back let's to that first. Go back to Howard and. Yes. So I have first. a question from Rachel who says, can you say anything about the Olympic athletes with raised fists? That was earlier than 9-11, of course. Yes. You're going back to Tommy Smith and John Carlos in the 1968 Olympics. And yeah, I have a lot to say about Tommy and John, um, having spent some time with both of them. And um, I just did an event with John pre-pandemic. I keep saying just, it was like last, last year, like 2020 didn't happen. It was 2019, we did an event. And um, uh, John is a wonderful, amazing human being. Um, one of my favorite things about John Carlos is that his business card says the world's fastest humanitarian. And that always makes me laugh. Um, I think one thing about John and about Tommy, especially in when we talk about them and then we talk about the sort of comparison to where we are today, especially in, in the case of someone like say, Colin Kaepernick, is that the finances of this can't be ignored. I remember I was at an event with Tommy and John during the 50th anniversary, we were in San Jose in 2018 where both of them went to school at San Jose State. And there's a wonderful statue of, the three, of uh, them and then an empty space for Peter Norman. Uh, who was the sil silver medalist at that time and who also lost everything by joining those players in that race fist when he went home to Australia, he was completely ostracized and, and treated as a traitor, even though he's, even though the countries weren't at war and he's not from the United States. But anyway, it's another story. Um, I think that, you know, Tommy and John, we talk about risk and they lost 
everything. They didn't lose some things, they lost everything. Uh, Tommy was a bus boy. John was a security guard. Nobody would touch them. Oh my goodness, hang on, sorry about this. I forgot to put this. Am I back, can everybody see me? Yeah. You can see, I can't see you, there we are, okay. Let's do something very quick and put this on airplane mode so the phone doesn't ring again. Um, and so, yeah, so those guys lost everything and they lost, um, both of them got opportunities to play football, but they weren't really football players. I mean, they lost their careers for doing uh, what they thought was right. And, you know, of course, Colin Kaepernick lost his career as well, but Colin Kaepernick had signed a $116 million contract before he lost everything. So he had, he had some form of cushion that the uh, that those guys didn't have, and I think that it's really it's it's really important to make sure we sort of understand these lineages. Um, we talk about this in my my the last book I did before this one, the the uh, the heritage penultimate book was the um, this was making this this lineage clean. It's not a clean lineage. Muhammad Ali is not Colin Kaepernick. It's not LeBron James. They're very, very different people. They're, you know, LeBron James's net worth is almost $500 million. And when you look at the things that LeBron James has done, he's doing them from a position of strength. He's doing them from a position of power, whereas Muhammad Ali had the entire force of the United States government on him um, and was risking prison for his beliefs. And so when we talk about this lineage of athletes and activism and all of the different terms that we use, it's important to remember exactly that these situations were not identical. And that also the, this new generation of player, I'm not even sure what their aim is. I think that their aim may be, I don't even call them activists necessarily. I, I say that they are, um, they're really influential people on the right side of issues. Activists to me is someone who's in the street. It's somebody who's actually on the front line. It's somebody who puts their body between them and their beliefs. And, um, and so I don't necessarily see that with today's athletes in a lot of ways. Some of them, yes, but most of them, no. And they are much more geared toward empire. They're much more, as you see, LeBron James just bought a piece of the Red Sox. He's got a couple percentages, uh, percentage points of the Fenway Sports Group. That is not activism. <laughs> That's money. That is power. That is ownership. These are the different questions. And so I always ask the question as we move forward, what is going to happen when the protester becomes the power? And these players now are moving toward something very different from the Tommy Smiths and the Muhammad Ali's and the John Carlos's and those guys. Um, there is a question as well, also from Rachel. Could you, could you comment on how the black quarterback threatens certain racial racist stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think that one of the, one of the big areas of sports, when you go back once again, historically, is the idea of meritocracy. The, the reason why sports is such an important part of our culture, uh, historically and also racially, is unlike entertainment, unlike music, unlike the movies, sports was considered an antidote to racism and that I mean that this country has always allowed black people to entertain them but you needed a movement to allow black and white players to play in the same field that you needed a movement to allow that to happen because if we can play in the same field and if we can shower together after we win and after we lose then why can't we live next door to each other and so that logic was really the piece that created the necessity for a movement. This is why there was such resistance to it. Um, the same is true when you think about athletics in terms of the actual on field. The attitude had been that the epicenter, the nerve center of baseball is the pitcher and the catcher. That's why there are very few pitchers, black pitchers and very few black catchers because these were considered the thinking positions. The athletic positions are outside. So you see a lot of black players in the outfield so they can go run and catch the ball but they're not being asked to think. The same is true for football. The, the nerve center of football is up the middle. You've got the center who's usually white, the quarterback who's white, the middle linebacker's white, and then the black players are usually on the outside, the wide receivers and the defensive backs. So there's a racial hierarchy to all of this, even though it may not look like it at first. So having a black quarterback 
changes that hierarchy. And one of the people who I tell him every time I see him, but he never gets any credit for this, is Jimmy Johnson, the old coach of Miami and the coach of the Dallas Cowboys and, uh, Miami and the Dolphins. Because what Jimmy did in the 1980s was his defenses became so fast and so athletic. You couldn't have a totem pole back there playing the position anymore. You couldn't have Drew Bledsoe just standing back there and getting creamed. He's not athletic enough. So now you had to go find a different athlete to play that position. And so in some ways, the evolution of the position became some of its antidote to racism in some ways. So Jimmy just changing the game because as the game got more and more and more athletic, you had to get different people to play it. And so that has really sort of taken on the, it, it's made you deal with some of the, the stereotypes of that position. On the other hand, it also reinforces some of those stereotypes when you have that quarterback being athletic. And of course, people say, oh, well, you know, he's just an athlete back there. He's not thinking he can't, you know, he can't read a defense. He's not a classic you know, Roger Staubach, Tom Brady, Terry Bradshaw, Joe Montana guy who's going to sit back there and look and throw the ball. So there is this constant battle about whether or not these players um, have both the mental capacity and the physical capacity to play. So the stereotypes are always sort of there. It's a battle. Uh, Mark Carpel has a question. You mentioned uh, being interested in seeing how the players navigate these, these trends. Is it possible to say anything about how sports writers and commentators navigate it? Yes, there's a lot to say about that. Um, we navigate it very poorly um, in a lot of ways in that, in that we, I always refer to, to, to what we do as a, a lot of us are lifestyle guys, right? It's a great job. You get to uh, go travel the world. You get to go travel the country. You get to watch you know, really talented people hit a ball with a stick and there's no murders, right? So I remember when I was at the Oakland Tribune, I had to go, oh, some 10 year old got shot in the chest in a, in a crossfire in East Oakland. And I had to go to this kid's mother's house to go get a picture of him so they could have a photo of the child who was killed uh, in a crossfire. So the Oakland Tribune had a photo of this. And I'm like, I don't wanna do this. So, I'd rather cover baseball and so, uh, or technology or something else. And so, you know, it's not exactly the only reason I got out of, of, of those types of things, but, um, but it's a certain contrast to, to going into the toy store, which is covering sports. And that's how a lot of the writers had always navigated. That's how the newspapers viewed it. They used to call us the toy department. So this was the place where you went where things weren't really serious, where you didn't have to deal with the crossfires and the murders and everything else. And so, whether we're talking about that from a serious standpoint in terms of you know, life and death situations, whether we're talking about it now in terms of politics, or whether we're talking about it back in the day in terms of labor, because baseball guys never wanted to deal with the strikes and the lockouts and everything else. We've always dealt with serious issues poorly because a lot of people that come into this business come here specifically to get away from the serious stuff. So when the serious stuff starts to follow them inside of the lines, they don't like that very much. For me, I, I got into this business. I mean, I didn't love covering murders, but I was covering technology at the San Jose Mercury News before I got into sports. And the reason I got into sports was because I wanted to do my first book, which, which was a history of race and baseball in Boston. It was really all about the sort of sport and sociology. So I've always navigated uh, toward or gravitated toward these, uh, these issues anyway. So for me, it's, it's sort of where I land, but for a lot of people in our business, if somebody says, we want you to cover a strike or a protest, they're like, no, 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 just give me the game, give me the final score, and I'm good with that. Um, Sarah has a question that says, I'm wondering what kind of pressure the players' new political attitudes are exerting on the owners. Are there recent cases where owners have changed their positions because they know that the players are opposed? Oh, yeah, we just saw one in, um, in Atlanta. I, I look at this, I wrote a piece on this the other day that uh, I think Colin Kaepernick is a really interesting contrast to what took place in Georgia. That to me, what happened here was not that remarkable. I mean, it was remarkable in the fact that they had to address it, right? Normally Major League Baseball, and they just sort of plow through things. We just saw the NBA All-Star game in Atlanta right before that vote. So it's not as though there was some great revelation taking place from a social justice standpoint. I think what took place here was that the, the selfish interests 
of the business of Major League Baseball happen to align by happenstance with doing the right thing. I think that baseball just absolutely knew they were going to get killed if they played that game in Atlanta. I think they just knew it couldn't be played. I mean, I think if you take what happened last year and you see George Floyd get killed, Jacob Blake get shot, Major League Baseball comes out and they make this big promise about being more inclusive and more diverse and then use all whatever terms you want. And then they say that they're going to then come out and they're going to incorporate the Negro League statistics into the historical record because that is some sort of reconciliation with the past. Then Hank Aaron passes away and you're gonna honor Hank Aaron with this looming over you? I think baseball just knew that this is not, this is Brian Kemp's headache, this is not, our headache. We don't need to deal with this. So I, I think on the one hand, they absolutely recognize that they're paying attention to the fallout and the backlash. On the other hand, I think that it's still business as usual. Where I mentioned Colin Kaepernick, however, was I think the two examples are similar in that in, in that the in in football the exact opposite happened, that football sacrificed its values because they knew it was unpopular. You know, they knew having actual American values was unpopular. It is perfectly within your right to protest. It is perfectly within your right to, dis to uh, express displeasure. But what Colin Kaepernick was expressing was so unpopular to the mainstream United States, they didn't wanna deal with that. They didn't need that headache, even though it was the right thing to do. In this case, they didn't, you know, baseball didn't need this headache and it happened to be the right thing to do. So at the end of the day, I still feel that the, the business is going to win. And I think that they did pay attention to pressure. Pressure always matters. And that knowing that that pressure matters, they were paying more attention to what that fallout was going to be. I think baseball recognized that taking a short term hit from the right wing was way, way more attractive than having people do documentaries about the fact that after Hank Aaron died, you still played a game in the state with knowing what was going on. I think they were like, you know what? Short-term headache, long-term gain. Um, Naomi, who has a phenomenal bookcase, which I have been envious of watching this the whole time. Um, I, I would like your bookcase. I don't have your bookcase. As you can see, I've got two bookcases and way more books. Um, do you have any thoughts about the way politics is being is playing out in women's uh, teams, for example, basketball and in trans people playing? Two different questions, but yes. Um, the trans issue is gonna be a really thorny issue. It's gonna be a really, really difficult issue because I think that unlike some of the other issues, there's much, much, much more um, tolerance for it. Maybe that's the best word for it. I mean, I think that there are gonna, we're gonna find out over the next several months and years that the people that you thought were allies on one issue are not necessarily allies on the trans issue. Um, especially, I mean, the number of people who were in the business who I respect and who I thought I knew <laughs> um, would say, many, many things about, um, you know, in fact, it was with John Carlos. John Carlos and I were doing an event at the Museum of New York. And one of the last questions was, what are you guys gonna do to protect our girls? And we're like, protect your girls from what? And it was all, it was a trans question. It was all about that, you know, if you let them come into the game, if you let them play, they're gonna take all the records away from our girls. They're going to overrun the game. And, and I just asked the question, where is there evidence of that? And so, but this is certainly a battle that's going to be uh, front and center over the next several uh, months and years. Um, as for the way the politics is playing out with women's teams, yeah, I think that if there's one thing that we've seen really since 2016, maybe even earlier with the Minnesota Lynx and Maya Moore and everybody's that the women are just so much better. You know, they're, they're better. They're just, they're smarter on the subject. They're, they're more they're, they take more risks than the men do. Maybe it's because the women don't make any money, that they don't feel like they have anything to lose. It goes back to Billie Jean King and the original nine back in Houston, where one of the players was talking about, oh my God, if we protest and if we go up against the men, we're gonna lose everything. And Billie Jean King walked over to her and said, we've already lost everything. We literally have nothing to lose. 
And that started this movement. You know, that, that speech in Birmingham changed that whole thing. And it made the women think, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, we got nothing. And, and all of a sudden now you've got a movement. And so I think that with the, with the, um, the Minnesota Lynx, I think with the players down in Atlanta, with Renee Montgomery, um, that I think they're realizing that we don't have anything to lose. And obviously, yes, I see Megan Rapino as well in there, who's somebody who is, you've got a face of this and that you're going to have to deal with some really motivated athletes. And anybody who knows anything about athletes, a motivated athlete is a very dangerous one because they are born to compete and they're fighting. Uh, let's see, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, all right, so Robert sent me a direct message, but I think this is for everybody, I'll, I'll read it. Um, it's a given that money calls all the shots, all caps, absolutely right. Um, do you see any progress in using money power to move social justice issues in the right direction? And are you familiar with Andrew Zimbalist's work on, of course, well, baseball and billions is right behind me. Um, and Andy Zimbalist is probably not very happy with me because we were neighbors and now I live over the bridge, but there are no restaurants to go to anyway. So once they open up, I'll drive over and Andy and I will have dinner. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I went to Carmelo Anthony, the, who's playing for the Knicks at the time. I remember asking him, um, you know, people would go to the players all the time. They, you know, Craig Hodges would do it with Michael Jordan. Come on, man, we got to get together. We could make our own league which is really, unfortunately, one of the dumbest things that people could say. Um, do the players have a lot of money? Yes, they have a lot of money compared to the amount of money that's in my pocket. Do they have a lot of money compared to Jerry Jones or Jeff Bezos? No, they don't. And so the fact that, um, you know, that Mookie Betts makes $30 million a year, that's a lot of money. But compared to Warren Buffett, it's not a lot of money. So this, idea, uh, as I was saying earlier, I think the players are going to find out the limits of what they can do. And I think they got slapped in the face a little bit earlier this year, because after Jacob Blake got shot last year, one of the things that came out of that was that the, the Wisconsin legislature came out and said that the, that, the, that the facilities for the Bucks and for the Milwaukee Brewers could be used as polling stations. And the minute the news cycle died down, they were negged on that. And mm -hmm. made the you know when the players, when the players went out and they they ended up not playing and they boycotted for a couple of days. It was like okay, we'll do this, we'll do this, and then they reneged on it. And so I think the players are finding out that this is a long term fight. This is not this concierge thing where because you're a super athlete, you can make a phone call to your local representative. They'll take the news cycle, they'll take the photo op, but then what's really going to change? You got to stay in it, and the players are starting to learn that. And once again, the women are learning that even faster than the men are, obviously, because they took down their own owner. I mean, Raphael Warnock won that election because of those basketball players. He was polling at 20 percent before they started wearing vote Warnock shirts and before they actually went after their own owner, Kelly Leffler. And by November, she lost. So I think that's it. No, Is no, there's a question from Dale. I think you. Did I scroll over, Dale? I think you scrolled over, Dale. I did. I'm sorry, Dale. Um, did MLB make its decision about the All-Star game in consultation with all the owners? Um, are there different positions? Yes. Um, the Atlanta Braves will tell you that they were not really consulted on this. And even if they were, they were told what was going to happen. There's a difference between being consulted and being told what's going to happen. All right. It's like, do I have a say in this or are you simply telling me what's going to happen? I think that the. I think that there was a fair amount of cowardice in this, because if you look at the very powerful Georgia business class, if you look at Major League Baseball sponsors during the run up to that bill, nobody said anything. They didn't say anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't come out. They didn't say, if this bill passes, it's going to have devastating consequences for our economy. Major League Baseball didn't say, you know, if this bill passes, we might move the All-Star game. Nobody said anything. Then the bill passes, and then they react. I mean, Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, was on ESPN last Thursday, a week from yesterday, and said that everything was going on as planned. The very next day, he's like, yeah, we're canceling. So I think what happened was that 
the the business class and the corporate class recognized that um, this is a loser and we're not going to deal with it. And I think one of the important things to remember about this is is not to confuse this with somehow now making Major League Baseball some ally in the fight for voter rights. Because at no point did they come out and say, well, we want to get the bill repealed. We're going to use our super PAC money and we're going to use all of our, re our resources and influence to get rid of a bad law that, takes, that occurs in a state where one of our franchises is. They didn't do any of that. They just said, it's bad for us to have a game here now. Let's move it to Colorado, which is what they did. So the idea that you're seeing if you're watching Fox News or anything or anywhere else that Major League Baseball, it's actually incredibly laughable to me that you have essentially 27 out of 30 Republican owners being called woke. <laughs> that <is laughs> um, all of it is sort of silly in its own way. But um, yeah, I think that baseball absolutely um, did what they did more in consultation with with their corporate partners and they just realized that they didn't have much of a choice. Um, Robert had another question. Uh, is the anti-vax thing a legacy of Tuskegee? Understandable, how crazy is our world? I think that was probably for me, but I could say that to everybody. Our world is crazy. Our world is very crazy. And we have all kinds of people. Um, let's put it this way. I think this, what we're seeing here in terms of the education and miseducation and misinformation is a byproduct of last year. This is what happens when you create doubt from the very start, from the very top. And I had somebody tell me yesterday that you know, bleach actually worked against COVID. I'm like, this is exactly what we're talking about. Um, you, know, you had a failure of leadership and everybody pays for that failure in leadership. And so now we're trying to figure out sort of what, how to retrofit that. Can it be retrofitted? And I, I think that there's a story in the Times today about a huge number of, I didn't see what the percentage was, an enormous number of, of vaccination appointments that are not being filled in Mississippi. And it's all because people are afraid that, you know, that the vaccination is unsafe. And so that, I'm sorry, that, you know, that vaccines are unsafe even though they probably have their measles, mumps, and rubella shots, right? So th this, is a, this is the price that we've paid for the last couple of years. Uh, Tucker asked a question at the Masters honoring Lee Elder. Window dressing? Yes, absolutely window dressing. Could not be more window. You could not dress a window more than what the Masters are doing right now. And I feel, I feel badly for Lee Elder because he's stuck. What is he supposed to do? Um, they trot Lee Elder out because they needed Lee Elder. But let's face it, when you watch the, the starters of the Masters come out, you look at, the, you look at this, this, this dog and pony show against the Masters history. The Masters didn't have a black member until 1990. They didn't have any women members until 2012. I mean, this is, all of this is sort of a reaction to pressure. Let's not, once again, let's, let's not try to make it seem as though that these sports leagues or these sports entities are allies in any sort of um, social justice because they're not, they're responding to pressure. And so you respond to pressure by doing desperate things. You take Lee Elder and you put him out there just because he's black, right? And so I feel bad for Lee Elder, although Lee Elder also could have said, no, no, thank you, I don't wanna go. And he didn't do that. And I think that this is sort of this um, space that we're in. Um, and especially a lot of the African-American players have been told to lean into this and that things are going to get better and things are better than they were. And then they put you in these horrible spots where you feel used. And I think that's what happened to Lee Elder. Uh, Northampton neighbors, can you address these issues? Are sports, horse racing, auto racing, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, NASCAR is a really good example of what's taking place in terms of corporate and political pressure. NASCAR wants nothing to do with black people. They never have. And yet now one of my friends is like the head of NASCAR in Nashville. And because they, after what happened last year, I think they all realized it, it's very similar in some ways to, um, we go back to Georgia. The only reason the Atlanta Braves have a team, the only reason they're in Atlanta in the first place is because when they were leaving Milwaukee as a condition to moving to Atlanta, 
they had to agree to have integrated seating at Fulton County Stadium. They had to agree that there weren't going to be colored water fountains and there was they, they were going to agree that they weren't going to have colored bleachers and all of that Jim Crow stuff. Birmingham, on the other hand, went in the other direction. So when you think about the rise of the corporate class in the South in business, it really did come down to one question. Are you going to ride with, with segregation or are you going to realize that segregation is going to bring us all down? Atlanta realized that it just wasn't going to last. You couldn't you could not be a world-class city and have this sort of violence in your, represent you. And Birmingham didn't. And Birmingham was actually in a far more advantageous position than Atlanta was. If you look at where they were in the 1930s and the 1940s, they had all the railroads, everything went through Birmingham. And I think that NASCAR and some of these other sports are in that same spot. We cannot do this anymore. We can't have the Confederate flag flying across all of our events and still be viable to advertisers, it just doesn't work. And so we go back to all of these questions and the questions, of course, we make it seem as though history is this sort of vague amorphous thing that happens to us. No, history is the byproduct of people making choices. And these are the choices that they've made and these are the choices that they're making. Um, Robert has another question. I've been turned off by the JR Jackie Robinson tributes as Jackie was not given a very friendly shake by MLB when, while he was alive. Self congrats and MLB is sickening. I love Rachel, but isn't his memory being used in a sense? Absolutely his memory is being used. And Rachel Robinson, by the way, will be 99 this July. Um, that is always great. Um, I love Rachel. And, um, and I'm really, really hoping that the Jackie Robinson Museum does open COVID, shut it down. Um, so they never had their grand opening. And the whole idea was to get that museum open while Rachel was alive. And so um, I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think for everybody wearing number 42 in Major League Baseball, I think that is something that is performative in some ways, performative in a lot of ways. And the question that I asked, I was with Rachel and Sharon Robinson and everybody at the last Jackie Robinson day in 2019, we're at Dodger Stadium. And we asked, I asked the question on the air um, on ESPN, which was, are we celebrating Jackie for something he did? Or are we celebrating Jackie Robinson's spirit as something that is part of our values? Because right now it certainly sounds like we celebrate him in the past tense. Are you walking the walk of what he stood for? Because if you're not, why is everybody wearing his jersey? And so I think that's part of baseball's challenge. And that's another reason why I think they knew they had to move the All-Star game. If you really say these issues matter to you, there's no way you could stand with that. And I personally believe, as I, I wrote in a story not too long ago, that the real issue here with Georgia was not about Black people in general or voting to me in some ways, voting sort of tangentially. I think it's the fact that this industry and its corporate partners want nothing to do with the 2020 election. They don't want anything to do with January 6th. They don't want anything to do with this SB 202 law. They know it's just bad for business to align or even tacitly look like you were justifying an insurrection. And I think that's actually kind of smart from a corporate standpoint. So I think that might be all the questions. And this has been just absolutely terrific. So thank you so much, Howard. Um, many virtual claps. This was really wonderful. I know a lot of people are going to want to watch the recording too. And um, we thank you so much for being part of us and telling us all these interesting and so very political things. And we're, we're, it was just wonderful. So Incredible. thank you so much. Thank and you. It was my pleasure. And uh, thank you for the invite. It's been, um, it's the, uh, I don't know, the 14 years I've been here, it's been great to be part of this community. So thank you very much. Great, great. And we're sorry you moved to Amherst, but come come <laughs> visit us. <laughs> well, my son is going to graduate from NHS. He's still okay, there. excellent. So we're, excellent. we're still connected. Excellent, excellent. All right. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.